Hello, and welcome to the Randomly Generated History Club, where three non-historians pick a year at random and try to learn things about it. I'm Anna, and I'm here with my two friends, Will and Ant. Hello. Hi there. This week, we are talking about the year 1347, one of the greats. Um, And let's just go right (laughs) into it with our three-word previews. Will? Big Serb King. (laughs) (laughs) I can tell you carefully considered those words. Uh, Okay, Ant? Fancy dress apocalypse. (laughs) Wow, I don't really have any idea what that is. Well, you'll find out soon. Uh, My three words are Marco Polo. How do you spell? (laughs) Um, I would spell it (laughs) P-F-F-F-T. Oh, yeah, just checks out. There's a slight T at the end, isn't there? Yeah, Yeah. there's a slight, yeah. Nice. Uh, well, great. I think everybody probably knows exactly what we're all about to talk about, <laughs> but let's do it anyway. All right. Today I'm talking about a man whose name is Shams Adin Abu Abdallah Muhammad ibn Abdallah ibn Muhammad ibn Ibrahim ibn Muhammad ibn Yusuf Alawati Atanji ibn Batuta. So oh. nice! <laughs> oh. Yay! Wow. And I'm going to say that every time I talk about <laughs> him. Uh, no, thankfully for us and for everyone, he just went by the name Barry. Ibn Batuta, <laughs> uh, which actually means son of the duckling. Oh. Which I think is great. Oh, wow. Um, of all his names to choose from, he chose that <laughs> Yeah, he, he just loved his dad, <laughs> duckling. His duckling dad. Uh, Ibn Battuta was an explorer who traveled through the entire Muslim world and beyond in a series of expeditions in the 12th century. Was he collecting names? He was collecting <laughs> names. <laughs> Everywhere he went, he got a new name. Um, and he traveled more than any other explorer in pre-modern history. He covered 117,000 kilometers, wow. which absolutely blows Marco Polo out of the water. Wow. <laughs> Anyone want to guess how many Marco Polo did? Oh, like 5,000 or something like no. that? 10, he did it overland, didn't he? So. I yeah. think 55,000. 24,000. Mm. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, yeah. Just Peanuts, back and, right? Back and forth in the. Yeah, know, he's whatever, just like though. doing laps around Italy at that point. <laughs> but yeah, Ibn Battuta did 117,000 kilometers. Um, Maybe. Uh, we'll, get, <laughs> we'll get to that part later. Uh, he was born in 1304 in Tangier in Morocco into a wealthy family of Qadis, who, which are Islamic legal scholars or okay. judges. When he's 21, he decides to go on Hajj, the pilgrimage to Mecca. But he really takes his time lost. getting there. <laughs> yeah, he's like, I guess I'll just go elsewhere. Uh, so he does eventually make it to Mecca, but he then doesn't return to Morocco for 24 years. Wow. Um, and this is the tail end of the Islamic golden age. So the Islamic world is massive. It stretches from Spain to Indonesia, and it essentially means that Ibn Battuta can travel freely through those lands and he can often find work along the way as a Qadi in the courts of various sultans who are, who are ruling these territories. Um, Obviously, it's not going to be a very fun podcast if I just spend the next eight minutes listing countries that he went. Uh, (laughs) There are many of them, but I'll give you some highlights. So one of his first stops is Iceland. Iceland. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, he got really lost from Morocco to Mecca and he ended up in Iceland. Um, No, he goes to Alexandria, Egypt. Oh. Oh, yeah. And he meets two ascetic monks who tell him that his destiny Be- as a world two, traveler... Two beautiful monks. Two uh, aesthetic. Aesthetic. Aesthetically pleasing, beautiful monks. Aesthetic, yes. Two aesthetically pleasing monks mm-hmm. who tell him that he is uh, foretold, for, foreordained to be a world traveler. Remarkable. And he is so awed by their beauty <laughs> that, that he listens to them. Nice. Uh, he journeys through the Holy Land, Syria, Iran, Iraq. He goes down the east coast of Africa to Somalia. He goes to Mecca several times on Hajj. Uh, and then in 1330, he decides to go to Delhi to work for the Sultan there. 
But he doesn't just head straight for India. He goes through Anatolia. He meets the sultan of the new Ottoman Empire. Hmm. He buys a young Greek girl as a slave. What? Oh, sorry. <laughs> he, <laughs> he gets up into the Golden Horde and meets with the Mongol Khan's court. He considers going to Siberia, but is like, nope, too cold. Not going to do yep. that. He goes back west to Constantinople to escort the Khan's pregnant wife. He meets the Byzantine emperor. He goes to Afghanistan, and then he finally crosses the Hindu Kush to make it to India three years later. Like, can you imagine that, like, interview process? So when can you start? <laughs> I know. Like, ooh, got a few errands to run yeah, first. Yeah, I'll be there, like, um, three years. And I guess the Sultan's HR team is just waiting <laughs> yeah, to he, onboard okay, him. Okay, so was he, quote, journeying, unquote? Or was he just, like, working in places and know. living in places? Yeah, so it it depends. Some of the places he goes and he stays for a while and works. But some he just goes through. And he, I really think he just had wanderlust. Yeah, but how did he get to meet so many famous people? He like, Well, he, as he yeah. travels, his the kind of legend around him grows. So by oh, right, this okay. point, he's 10 or 15 years into this journey. He's started to get a reputation. He's accumulating wealth. So he's got this big retinue of, you know, slaves and <laughs> other sort of people that travel with him. So by the time he gets to a new place... The leader of that place has okay, usually yeah, heard so of him. Like, oh, yeah, 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 so he goes and works in their court. Yeah, I get that. So he, he really gets around. Um, he's doing sure. a lot. But yeah, so he finally makes it to India. Um, he works with a sultan in Delhi for six years, partly because the sultan won't actually let him leave. Okay. Uh, he alternately loves Ibn Battuta and accuses him of treason. <laughs> which I think are two quite extreme. That's a um, toxic relationship yeah. right there. Yes. <laughs> that, to be fair, is how I feel about both of you. <laughs> um, but then the Sultan decides to send Ibn Battuta to China on a diplomatic mission, and he goes straight there. Wow. No, he doesn't. Oh. Uh, <laughs> he goes to the Maldives. Because, <laughs> because why wouldn't you? I mean, he deserves a break. He deserves a break. Yeah, he needs to but kick back. But before all the tourist infrastructure in the yeah. Maldives, yeah. it must have been quite difficult to enjoy it. Yeah. Well, I think the beauty was there from time immemorial. Okay. okay. Well, the white sands. But yeah, the white sands are not imported by the hotel chains. Okay. But yeah, I, he doesn't... Well... He sort of does and doesn't have a great time in the Maldives. So he doesn't have a great time there because he's working as a Qadi, as a judge, and he's trying to get the people of the Maldives to conform to his own more orthodox interpretation of mm. Islamic law. No beach parties in Maldives. No is, beach yeah, parties. Yeah. Mini bar empty. Mini yeah. bar empty, publicly whipping people for not attending Friday yeah. prayer. Yeah. And yeah. then in the in the real horrible one, uh, forbidding women from being topless in public which was apparently the norm on the islands at the time. <laughs> so the people in the Maldives were like, um, thank you, but no, thank you. Yeah, and free he's the basically dis <laughs> dismissed. Um, Sounds like the hotel I went to last year. <laughs> <laughs> Two star rating. Two star. In retrospect. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. But uh, he does have a good time in the Maldives because he marries four different women. Wow. And again, he was there for nine months. <laughs> That's so incredible. He's, he's really he's really just tearing through them. Across the course of his journeys, he marries uh, like dozens of women and has children with many of them. Yeah. And then we'll just leave them and sometimes check in on them when he's passing back through that town on his way back to Morocco <laughs> or whatever. But in the Maldives, apparently this was quite common. Women would have... Well, first of all, they were women in the 1300s, so they had absolutely no yeah. agency. But they they didn't have any sort of social mobility, but they would often have small dowries. So it was apparently pretty common practice for sailors or travelers to come to the islands, marry a woman, get her dowry, stay with her for a little while, and then leave. And I have no idea why this was beneficial to the women, but <laughs> yeah. uh, apparently why, that was pretty common. Why did it perpetuate? Yeah, I guess maybe because it gave them 
a little more at like access to a different type of world. They could maybe leave their family homes yeah, and go live okay. with their husbands or something. Mm. But yeah, so uh, Ibn Battuta in the Maldives. I'm starting to think that women haven't had a really good time throughout history. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think you might be onto something yeah, I there. Don't know. Anyway, so he leaves the Maldives. He leaves all his wives behind. Uh, in 1345, he finally makes it to China. And then in 1346 or 47, he starts his journey back to Morocco. And when he finally gets there... He learns that both of his parents have died while he's been gone for 24 years. Yeah, makes sense. <laughs> he's presumably very sad about this, mm -hmm. but not too sad because after only a few days in Tangier, he sets out on another voyage. I um, he's going to say he gets married again. <laughs> he, gets, he probably did, honestly. L let him loose for a few days. He's taken a wife. Interestingly, at no point on any of his voyages over these decades did he keep a diary oh, or a record or write anything down. So uh, in 1354, when someone suggests he write a book, mm -hmm. he dictates the whole thing by memory. And the book is eventually called A Masterpiece to Those Who Contemplate the Wonders of Cities and the Marvels of Traveling. Hmm. But it is more commonly known as the Rihla, which just means like travelogue. And it turns out that maybe not everything in the Rihla is what you might call accurate. Yeah. And some of it is what you might call plagiarized. Uh, okay. Okay. There are striking simu similarities to some of Marco Polo's accounts of his own travels, which yep. had happened a few de decades earlier. And then there are passages that are pretty much lifted entirely from other travelogues. So it's almost certain that he didn't go to every place he claims to have been. But he definitely went some places. Yep. <laughs> and the Rihla is, at the very least, a great account of what the world was like in the 14th century and in the courts of these various sultans and emperors. Mm. So anyway, that's just a very little bit about the voyages of Ibn Battuta, one of the greatest explorers in history, probably. <laughs> People don't journey these days. Yeah. No. People visit the place. Yeah. Because you're there so quickly. Yeah. You you set out to go to a specific place, then you get there, yeah, and then you're there. Also, well, it's harder to just wander, right? Because right. you feel like you've got to have a plan. I also don't get like you know given diplomatic missions to, yeah. to envoy to to China. Yeah, because like, in reality, you like you get on a Ryanair flight. Yeah, <laughs> send an then, email, and then you're presumably doing the mission. <laughs> well, and can you imagine the the bureaucratic hassle that a voyage like that would take today? You'd have to get a visa for oh. about eighty different countries. Yeah. You'd have of to course. like. I don't know, make sure your cell phone worked everywhere you went. Um, it would be horrible. Yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't accrue any wealth. You wouldn't accrue any yeah. wealth. You probably wouldn't be able to marry more than one person. Um, so what's even the point? What's the point? Really? Are, we, are we really free? <laughs> I long for the days of Ibn Battuta, son of a duckling. I'm going to talk about Stefan Dushan, also known as Dushan the Mighty. Dushan, good name. Also known as the douche. <laughs> <laughs> Not to his face. If you well. knew what was good for you. Yeah. So this is the guy who You're was You're not supposed king. to douche your face anyway. <laughs> <laughs> good grief. This is the guy who was king of Serbia from 1331. And then later on, uh, Dushan was czar or emperor of the Serbs and Greeks until he died in 1355. And during his life, Dushan co conquered a large part of Southeast Europe and became one of the most powerful monarchs anywhere in the world in the period. And his rule was basically hugely significant for the Serbs because under his rule, uh, Serbia became the major power in the Balkans and also became an, eth uh, an Eastern Orthodox, multi-ethnic, multilingual empire that stretched all the way from uh, the Danube in the north down to uh, the Gulf of Corinth in the south. And it was its capital at the time, which was Skopje, which is now the capital of Northern Macedonia. So that was mm. where it was centred. So cool. it was a hugely significant period of uh, history for Serbia. And there's a bunch of ways in which he showed himself to be an exceptional leader, uh, including establishing the first constitution Ooh, oh. wait, it, for the Serbian Empire. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, there have probably been other constitutions. Yeah, although, I mean... Probably not that many. Not that many. Yeah. Um, although it was like lesser constitution and more just stuff he wanted to happen. Okay. <laughs> it was a wish list. It, it was a writer. Yeah. It was, it was em emperor <laughs> Only writer. Only brown M&Ms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
uh, and it became known as Dushan's Code, okay. which was uh, and it's probably the most important literary work of medieval Serbia. Dushan's and- Code sounds like an arcade game from the eighties. It does, yeah. You know, <laughs> really retro. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. Or a cheat code for like Mortal Kombat or something. Oh, yeah. Uh, And generally under his rule, Serbia reached a territorial peak and also its political, economic, cultural, just generally everything peak during his time. And then when he died in 1355, that then marked the end of the resistance to the Ottoman Empire, Mm. who had been steadily advancing uh, and also brought about the subsequent fall of the Eastern Orthodox Church in the region, which is all just hugely significant because it then set the scene for the way Serbia and the wider Balkans have then been this centerpiece for yeah. civilizational tussle ever since. Yeah. In in so many different ways between the East and West mm-hmm. and the Orthodox world and in so many yeah, in so many different ways. Wow. There's also lots that's remarkable about his life and the way he lived as well. So he was heavily influenced by the Byzantines, who themselves Byzantines no, or Byzantines? No. It's definitely not the Byzantines. It's not the Byzantines, it's the Byzantines. I say Byzantines. Mm. <laughs> heavily influenced by the Byzantines. How about by Byzantium? Yeah. Byzantium? No. <laughs> <laughs> he was heavily influenced by the Byzantines, who themselves, of course, were successors to the Romans. Yeah. Basically were Romans in many ways. And he deliberately tried to emulate them. So uh, as a result, he was the first Serbian monarch who wrote most of his letters in Greek. Oh, okay. And also signed with imperial red ink, which carried on for a while afterwards. And then he was also the first to publish Prostagma, which is a kind of... Excuse me? Prostagma. Stagma. Okay. Potentially pro stagma. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you don't want to be anti stagma. <laughs> well, I'll actually clarify what it is, what is, before, what is I, before I die on Well, this it's film. a kind of Byzantine document, which okay. was, uh, again, a, like, a characteristic thing that Byzantine rulers had. All right. And under and in his royal title, uh, the which was the emperor of the Serbs and Greeks, he was trying to claim to be the successor to the Eastern Roman Empire. Yeah. And if that wasn't enough, he also gave Byzantine court titles to his nobility. Uh, and which then continued until about the 16th century. So like lots of rulers before and yeah, after, yeah. he was trying to, you know, create this link with the Romans yep. as a way of propping up his own authority and legitimacy. Man, people really do love claiming descent from the Romans to what, prop up their own legacies. Which brings me to my next point of how I claim descent from uh, <laughs> the Romans and the Greeks myself. Yeah. So you I were a the... concubine, weren't you? In the... I, was... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was a concubine, yes. Palace. Yeah, yeah, I was. Yeah. <laughs> Caesar's... That was in LA, yeah. though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and contemporary uh, writers describe Dushan as unusually tall and strong. Love that. And try, yeah, try to control yourself. Yeah. <laughs> well, he's yeah. no uh, Robert Keith Card. <laughs> yeah, I know how taken you are with yeah. tyrannical medieval Ugh. figures. Can't get enough of them. <laughs> uh, but they describe him as, quote, the tallest man of his time. Oh, wow. Love it. Very handsome and a rare leader full of dynamism, quick intelligence and strength, bearing a kingly presence. Wow. That's that's pretty good. It's great. Yeah. And according to contemporary depictions, he had dark hair and brown eyes. And in adult age, he grew a full beard and even longer hair. <laughs> <laughs> wow, really painting so a, descriptive. A, a vivid picture. That historian that. would not be yeah. a good Mills and Boone writer. <laughs> he had long hair and then later had slightly longer hair until he got it cut and it was shorter. Some of the quite supposed historians from this period are yeah. no better than us. <laughs> <laughs> Their <laughs> podcasts were shit. <laughs> uh, he had some amazing titles. So he was first crowned Young King when he was heir apparent okay. on the mm-hmm. 6th of January 1322, but he was too young to really rule with his father at that point. And then he was given the province of Zeta later on, so he became king of Zeta, which is quite cool. And then in 1331, he succeeded his father as king of all Serbian and maritime lands. Ooh, <laughs> maritime lands. Maritime lands. Like, is yeah. that like subaquatic, like the actual ocean floor, or is that like islands? No, that's subaquatic ocean floor. So that's- okay, yeah, yeah, good. He was the king good. of the seabed. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And his what was Ariel's his father called? King, Triton. King, king Triton. Triton. Yeah, okay. yeah. He, he was Triton the king took of- over from him. <laughs> yeah, I think in the 1380s. <laughs> that's right. And then, um, yeah, then Triton was king of all maritime sea floors and crustaceans. That's correct. <laughs> and their orchestras. <laughs> 
And then in 1346, he was crowned Emperor of the Serbs and Greeks. And this title was soon enlarged into Emperor and Autocrat of the Serbs and Greeks and Bulgarians and Albanians. Wow. (laughs) Do they know this as well? And do they agree to it? Who the Bulgarians and Albanians? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think they. I think they knew about it. What about the uh, uh, subaquatic group. Bulgarians? Were they part of this as well? <laughs> well, as in like lobsters who identify as Bulgarian. Yeah, yeah, sure. I, I think they were included in the maritime. Lands that was at this a point. different. That was a rebellion uh, oh, okay. later on in his reign. I think <laughs> the Bulgarian lobster rebellion. That's right. Yeah. Well, well, let's not talk about it here because we might get yeah, it yeah. in a different year. <laughs> so many nipped fingers. <laughs> A lot of pincer movements. Oh, yes. God. Uh, yeah, so there you go. Unsurprisingly, given he was the guy who took the Serbian Empire to its absolute height, he remains a total folk hero in Serbia. Yeah, yeah. And there are, for instance, in lots of like strategy games, you can play his campaigns and things nice. if you're Serbian. <laughs> uh, and he remains just this massive historical figure for them. There you Dushan go. Dushan the Mighty. The mighty. Dushan the Mighty. It's pretty good. I yeah. like him. Cool dude. Cool. So for my uh, lesson today, children, oh God, <laughs> we shall be discussing Italy. Oh, uh, what a new topic for you, Ant. For a change. <laughs> uh, but specifically, I am not going to steer anywhere close to the Medicis mm-hmm. or any of that kind of nonsense. Mm-hmm. I'm going to talk about a chap called Cola di Rienzo. Mm. So Cola was an Italian kind of revolutionary of sorts. He was a populist and a nationalist. Um, he's a very interesting figure that sort of combines sort of political intrigue with sort of allegory and populism and sort of prophecy of doomsday and 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 like pageantry as well as his gifts okay. for oratory to sort of uh, whip up public discourse and, and change the course of politics in Rome. Hmm. So it was a very turbulent time in Europe at the time, uh, especially for Rome, who were on the descendancy because this was during what was called the Avignon pa- Papacy. Oh, oh yes. yes. Oh, yeah, the the Great Schism. Correct. Or the Babylonian Captivity. Yes. uh, Where the Pope had actually left Rome. It was was, was ensconced in Avignon in France. And it's about 70 years period where the Popes there were selected and controlled by the French kings, Mm. which meant that while Rome was on a descendancy, they lost a lot of, like you know, that sweet, sweet pilgrim uh, economy. Yeah. wasn't flooding in. But all the communion wine was like, you know... Cabernet now. <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it just wasn't wasn't the same. Yeah. Uh, uh, and the Holy Roman Empire was also, there's separate claimants, there's a lot of sort of schisms. There was also the sort of, you know, the, the divide between the Gelfs and the Giblians, which was... Uh, <laughs> Sorry, did you say elves and goblins? <laughs> elves and goblins. <laughs> the Gelfs and Giblians, uh, <laughs> which was the divide of, of like pro-papists and secular empire. <laughs> um, no, no. This is true? <laughs> no, this is true. no, no, I'm no. I'm losing this my mind at so the Gelfs Itali- and the Giblians. <laughs> Gelfs and the Giblians were the two Italian sides that one were pro-papists. Well, these are Italian words. <laughs> yes, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> the, 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 the papist Gelfs and the, 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 the secular... Giblians. Oh my um, god. Anyway, we're getting completely off track here, okay? They don't feature any further. What's the track? The, the track is <laughs> Rome. There's lots of unrest and rifts throughout Christendom. Rome is very much on the down. Right. Uh, and Cola comes into our story here. He was born of very humble origins. He was the son of an innkeeper and a washerwoman in a very bad part of town in Rome. But he did receive a liberal education. Which doesn't mean nowadays liberal education, which is like, you know. Yeah. And is this the story of how he defeated his arch nemesis, Pepsi? <laughs> <laughs> this, his secret blend of yeah. Yeah, flavors. No, um, he, he, he didn't receive any sort of knowledge on how to make be- fizzy beverages, but he did learn mm. Greek and Latin. And he was able to uh, practice speaking in public quite a lot to increase his oratory ability. And he became a notary and therefore was, oh. you know. Yeah, exactly. He was real power. He, you know, he he gained and gathered a bit of power there in sort of the sort of bureaucracy of Rome, and so it wasn't so lowly stationed. Um, but he did have a flair for the dramatic, uh, and the style of his writings and the style of his uh, speech. And he also was a bit obsessed that the end of times was coming and that Christianity was uh-huh. you know Rome was falling and therefore like this is very <laughs> prophetic and yeah. you know, people should rise up etc. People are very quick to call end of times, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. we are. Yeah. I mean, they're... they're well, I they're think, right, though. Yeah, time has been ending since it began, if you really Ooh, think about it. Wow, so deep. Uh, <laughs> so, if you finished ripping on your bong... <laughs> it helps me podcast. Yeah. So, during this time of decline in Rome, 
poverty and infighting had happened because, you know, the, the scarce of the resources, the barons and the oligarchs were fighting their street-to-street battles and some of them were often barricaded to stop the, you know, quarrelling and stuff, spilling into the streets. And uh, Cola was rising in the sort of bureaucracy and he went to Avignon as part of a delegation mm. um, because what had happened is there was a change in sort of political leadership inside Rome from where the barons were directly controlling to a newly set up uh, quote unquote 13 good men which <laughs> were uh, chosen by the barons so yeah. it's basically the same thing that's a sequel to 12 angry men <laughs> exactly 12 13 good men as an excellent speaker he gets to meet the pope and he actually tries to persuade this french pope to come back to rome he gains friends but also enemies by decreeing the sort of baronocracy that's happening and the oligarchs and so on um but, uh, and they try to discredit him, but the Pope actually quite likes him, so he has the Pope's favour, and that carries a lot of weight, and therefore he can't just be completely ousted from society. Yeah. Um, Hang on, then. where's the Pope right now? The Pope's in Avignon. Okay. So he comes back without a Pope to come back to Rome. Pope okay. stays there. But what he does is he uh, he goes on a mission then to bring back what he thinks is the Imperial Republic of Rome. Oh. And he does this in a sort of a very flamboyant way. If you look at any sort of inscriptions or or drawings or paintings of them. He's always wearing these flamboyant capes and hats or like mm. full suits of armour. It was a bit out of place. <laughs> just um, walking around in a full suit yeah, of armour. Like yeah, wow. honestly, he was like, he dressed in fancy capes and, and vestments and he made, like, he painted um, large allegorical murals on buildings as sort of propaganda pieces. Wow. Well, he just, himself uh, I'm sure he probably had people that painted So he him. was Banksy. He's, yeah, Proto effectively. Banksy. And like, they were like, you know, very much on the nose of like the goddess of truth crying in the river kind of thing. And this is like, you uh, know, the, uh, mourning at the loss of, yeah. all this kind of stuff. But, it, you know, the barons hated it, but the, 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 the you know, the, the peasants, the regular people. Yeah. Imagine um, if you did it. that today. That would just bring down society. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, if I painted a picture of a woman crying in a river. <laughs> oh, World War Three. <laughs> the barons are getting quite annoyed at him now, but he's popular and the people use him as a focal point of this like romantic populist ideal of a Roman empire. And he's gathered a lot of allies. And then on May 20th in 1347, Cola, dressed flamboyantly again as a knight in full armour, leads an armed procession to the Senate and declared a new republic, which caused the barons to up and flee. Uh, and then he wow. took the title of Roman Tribune for himself. Nice. A title uh, which I assume had lapsed completely some lapsed. hundreds and, of years ago. And this ago. is the whole shtick, right? Like yeah. he was, he sort of whipped up that sort of populist ideal, that sort of romantic idea of the Roman, yeah. ancient Roman Empire to bring it back together and that they could build this sort of thing again and that it was part of their DNA and stuff. Yeah. So he used that sort of imagery along with sort of modern ideals My God, together. And, and Dushan was doing the same thing at the same time. Who's a Roman to believe? Yeah, no, there's, there's so many Romans everywhere. Yeah. But uh, so, so the Roman Tribune, which was a, an ancient title, um, it's an elected official or it also could mean spiritual man. And he mixed this ancient Roman and sort of Catholic ideals to take back the power. Okay. It's, uh, you know, it's kind of an interesting sort of political approach to how you sort of uh, stir the masses to your, yeah. to your political ends. Um, and so Cola really saw himself as ushering in a new age of restoring Rome. And he sent out letters across Italy into the Pope saying, you know, the new Rome is established. Uh, and that he had this really interesting argument to make where it wasn't just that God chose kings or emperors to rule. He also believed that God could choose the people to rule as well. Mm. That by enacting this form of rule from the populism, that that the people in, you know, so sort of proto-democracy, I guess, uh, you know, it is, is de, yeah. de facto a legitimate form of ruling. Uh the Pope hated this. <laughs> yeah, I'm just, uh, there goes Many the favour of the Pope. Yeah. Uh, but his love of pageantry kept on going and he kept on get, getting a bit more grand. He knighted himself. He bathed <laughs> in the baptistry of the lantern, or the latern, which is the papal sort of baptismal font wow. in Rome. And he went on to claim Rome as a sovereign state. Uh, this wrinkled a lot of people yeah. the wrong way. Um, and it could be interpreted probably quite rightly, as wresting Rome from Pope Clement in Avignon. Well, to be fair, if Clement wanted Rome, he should have been in Rome. Yeah, fair. You know what I mean? I'm team cola here. In it to win it. (laughs) So he was losing fans in Avignon and he was kind of seen as a usurper and heretic. And the barons were also gathering power against this guy and they they mounted an attack. But cola defeated them soundly because the people had all raised up against them. And he took a lot of barons prisoner. A lot of them were killed as well. But Pope Clement interjected. He threatened Cola with excommunication, not just for him, but for the entire city of Rome. Oh so my God. the Pope, one of the powers a Pope has, 
if you believe in this sort of thing, um, is to place a city under an interdict, which is effectively a mass excommunication. Wow. And so the Pope threatened this. And that was not going to fly with the, the, the locals. Yeah. And Cola knew that this was over. The Pope had pulled a trump card. Um, and so he had no choice. He fled. Uh, he was effectively excommunicated on the run. And this is when the Black Plague struck. So he had incorporated into his um, uh, sort of shtick and his spiels about like the end of times is coming and the new oh. world order and that kind of stuff. Maybe not exactly those words, but, but still, a, 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 he saw the Black Plague, plague as a... Yeah, pestilence. Yeah, he saw yeah. this as a, an absolute sign. Rome had fallen from him. The Black Plague has struck. This is God speaking to him. Um, he, he thought that he could get to the Holy Roman Empire and maybe he could get them on their side instead, on his side. So he introduced himself. He travelled for ages to get there and he introduced himself as a visionary. He said he was a visionary. I pro- prophesy this black plague that's happening. And he also claimed that his mother uh, was actually made pregnant not by his father, but by the previous Holy Rom- Roman Empire, uh, which would make Cola uh, uh, Emperor Charles's uncle. So he went along and said, hi, I'm a visionary and your uncle, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, the emperor did actually like him because he's a fantastic speaker, great company, bit of a laugh, lad, a bit of a lad on the on the booze as well, great fun. But um, he didn't want to rock the boat, boat, you know, the delicate p- power balance, and so he uh, he didn't, uh, you know, get on his side and sort of against the pope. And eventually, the pope in Avignon um, asked uh, Emperor Charles, please send him to face charges of heresy. And so. Emperor Charles, he had to do it, but he took him a couple of years to do it. He, you know, he didn't want to send him he straight away. He didn't want to get but, rid of his buddy. He, he did send him across to Avignon in the end. Um, but at this stage, Pope Clement had actually died. And therefore, there was no trial for heresy. And uh, Cola sort of, you know, went down on his knees and said, please forgive me. You know, I'm just doing what I thought was right. And Pope Innocent now thought that he could actually use Cola to counter the brewing unrest that's still happening in Rome with the barons and all this kind of like weird fancy ideals that Cola had left behind, including from one of his followers who was now sort of taking charge. Yeah. Um, and the Pope Innocent actually confirmed his status as a knight and appointed him an official senator in Rome. So what he had seized power beforehand and given himself, the Pope had then invested in him as well. Um, and he went there to Rome to sort of work on behalf of, of Pope Innocent. And he gathered the barons and said, right, this is the way things are going to be. This is the new thing. I'm in charge on behalf of the Pope. Uh, the barons also hated this. <laughs> huh, the barons, <laughs> the they barons, can't be pleased. They, they, they were not happy. Uh, they would not swear fealty to the new government. They once again rebelled. And so Cola took to the streets to gather the one thing that he had on his side, the people. And so standing probably in a fancy cape and a hat, uh, he stood in a barrel and like gathered the people and they immediately started booing and jeering him. Well, I was going to say, because aren't they still mad at him for getting them all excommunicated? Yeah, Yeah, they're so mad at him. They nearly got excommunicated. (laughs) Read the room, dude. And and like he he had lost all his power with the people whatsoever because he fled and he didn't bring anything and life just got worse for them. Uh, and they had enough of a shtick and uh, they turned at him. So he had to flee uh, from from <laughs> gather, rallying the troops. He dressed himself as a pauper, but was soon discovered when his rich robes underneath were spotted flapping underneath the, uh. in the end of the robe or whatever. Uh, he was seized upon by the people and killed by an angry oh. mob. He was then hung upside down outside the church of San Marcello for two weeks Ugh. and then was burned ceremonially um, in, in, in a location that was normally used for like em, em, empire Pyres oh yeah, yeah, back God. in the day in in Italy, so it was very sort of a um, you know poignant fitting. Man, back in the day, they end. really knew how to kill people. Yeah, I mean, kill them and then keep <laughs> killing them and then uh, do yeah. just horrific things to them after they're dead. Yeah, and, and so Cola, he's a fascinating man. Uh, he, you know, the way he sort of came about power, he wove ancient allegory, doomsday prophecies, and tapped into sort of that spiritual identity of Italy. Um, he was ultimately unsuccessful, but he, he's he's still to this day, you know, inspires Italian nationalists and, and has, mm. has gone on for, for years after his death. He really made a big mistake going back that final time, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. he did, yeah. yeah. He could have just settled down he and become just stayed at, um, with, a with consultant his nephew, or an accountant. <laughs> or a, <laughs> yeah, yeah. could have done anything. Yeah, he could have been like a, a high school drama teacher. I think I he would have been well fit for that. Yeah, it's worth looking him up though, because the pictures of him, he's he's always in this crowd of people just wearing normal clothes and yeah. he's wearing something completely flamboyant and unnecessary. You know what's crazy? If he existed now, he would probably be running for president oh, yeah. of the United yeah. States oh, yeah. and he'd probably do quite well. Yeah. Well, especially <laughs> with the Pope in his side. Yeah, yeah. Such a demagogue. <laughs> he's got a flair for the theatric, hasn't oh, he? Oh, Cola, what a man. There you go. It's 1347. <laughs> Thank you.
Thanks for joining us. That's everything you'd ever need to know about the year 1347. Mm -hmm. So, Will, can you please boot up the random number generator? Of course. It is getting to its operating temperature and the next year for next week will be the year 244. 244. We've been close to that. We had 261. Do you want to know a secret? Yeah. Yep. The year 244 is my favourite year. Wow. <laughs> wow. What will you be discussing, Will? Which of your favourite topics? There's so yeah. much I could discuss. <laughs> the only thing that's happening now is Rome. I'm going to be doing Rome three episodes in a row, I yeah. think, now, Which I'm okay with. <laughs> that's because you're on the Medici's payroll now, so you just have to talk about Italy. Look, oh, everyone's sorry, got a I'm, price. I'm not supposed to say that <laughs> Everyone's loud, got right? their price. <laughs> okay, 244. Yeah, there will be Rome. There Which, are other things. Can we just apply to the council to, to change the rules to be like from 1950 to 2000 <laughs> instead? Like, just do that. I think You know, you know this is our podcast. Yeah, no, but we, we report can... to the council, obviously. Yeah. Oh, you, oh, you mean the board? The, the f- board, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not well, like the local council. Not the local... <laughs> <laughs> this isn't like a public service. Isn't it? <laughs> it it's opposite. Oh. It's, it's, almost, it's yeah, a public disservice. It's a public disservice. That is definitely true. A-level results are right down across the country. <laughs> Well, if the mayor wants to actually sponsor us, that's fine. That's true. Yes. Yeah, we've made entreaties to the mayor of Hull. So <laughs> anyone else, we're, we're listening. Um, okay, cool. Well, 244, it's going to be great. We will see you then. Bye.